Let's see. Are they... There we go. And then share my screen with a little bat loop. And can everybody see, well, actually, you're looking at, should be looking at my email right now. Can everybody see dot loop here? Yeah. There we go. Yep. So we got a listing appointment. Again, I, I haven't trained on listing. You know, Kendall, Kendall at Lucas Howard Group does, comes in and does a really great uh, listing presentation for us. Um, obviously, they're one of the top listing teams in, in our organization. And that's a session you're not going to want to miss. Um, I'm trying to set up with her to get that recorded for us too, or at least do a, a live Zoom on that. But um, so you go and do your listing appointment, and then it's like that people say, yes, I want to list my house with you. So what do we do, right? <laughs> um, and again, we're training in that loop. Eventually, you know, when we go to DocuSign, um, fundamentally shouldn't change. You should have fillable forms, um, folders with, with templates in there that you need. Um, for those of you that haven't been on dot loop yet, we're going to speed through creating a loop. Um, let's see here. I've got, oh, you know what? We may have a loop already on this. If we can find a listing I've got coming up here. Does everybody know where to find the data for property information, um, aside from historical perspective on the MLS? So client calls and says, hey, come list my house at 123 Main Street. Um, and you need to look up like permanent parcel number, legal description, square footage of the building. Does everybody have a grasp on that? or? If, if I asked you that, would you say, hey, I know where that is? Or would you say, I have no idea what you're talking about? And, and either answer is fine. So <laughs> you can just go to the city city website or something, right? They'll see all that info. Yeah. So um, if you just go over here, there's, there's two things you can look up. Um, let's say it's city of Grand Rapids, right? Um, you may want to write this down, either BSA, which is BS and, and A is the website um, that runs all the property information websites in, in the state of Michigan. So if I just Google City of Grand Rapids BSA, you get City of Grand Rapids BSA. And then you can look up a property address by address, name, or parcel number. Um, address is a little finicky. Sometimes if it's a, you're missing a north, northwest, northeast sort of thing. And my keyboard is working. I just happen to know the last name of this seller. So we're going to pop that in real quick. This is the listing we have coming up. Odd James Shake is his name. Now, some of these you're going to get to a screen and the picture is going to be blurred out and it's going to say, hey, pay us three bucks unless you're the homeowner. Um, just get used to paying that like Montcalm County, Muskegon County. Sometimes you have to pay for these things. Most of Kent County is free, uh, depending on the municipality. Um, so you have that there. Uh, you've got um, everything you need here as far as assessed value, taxable value for the MLS. Um, this doesn't, this is a condo, so it doesn't have a lot dimension, but that would be there if you had a, a set lot, um, sales history, you've got, um, square footage. This is a small condo, 522 square feet. Uh, it's one story ranch on a slab. It's a ground floor unit, um, tells us there's a th one, one bathroom in there. I should say one bedroom here somewhere. Um, and so that's a good property data place to start. I prefer to trust municipality information over uh, MLS history because we don't know who entered that information, but you can always compare it to that as well. Um, the other website, and again, if you're 
in Kent County, you would want to do um, excess Kent, which is a good overhead GIS system. Now on this one, I'm going to throw in a different address because condos, well, let's, let's do the condo. I'll show you how they come up. It's a little bit. Type in the street number, street name. You can do a range of numbers there too. This is everybody at 23 College. So there's 24 units down there and we can select him from this group. And so again, a little bit more limited information. You've got sales history. It'll go into if there was a split on the property tax description. The thing I like about this is it has the overhead um, GIS system. And so any other county, I always just Google like Montcalm County GIS system. So if you remember BSA, Access Kent and GIS system, you'll have a lot of the data at your fingertips. So this is, you can see as a satellite photo. Now with a condo, they're gonna list all those little permanent parcel numbers there. And that's where it can be a little challenging if you're trying to just zoom in on a property and then click on the on the property but and this is actually kind of fun to play with because then you can go around zoom around the city and see who owns what and or around the whole county really with access Kent, um see who owns what maybe you'll find a big tract of land that you know you're interested in learning more about see who owns it um buzz up here oh here's kind of some wooded vacant land housing associates llc um, it's part of an apartment complex up there, but it's mostly unbuildable green space right there behind this apartment. So, but anyway, um, get to know what you're selling. This is a good way to do it. Property histories, ge geography. I kind I love looking at maps. And so, um, it's kind of the second nature for me to dig in, try to not to go down too many wormholes and, and, uh, spend hours on there. But, um, so we would have the, um, uh, it looks like we have one more here. Maybe we drop John. Um, Ottawa County has that too, doesn't it? Uh, is it Access Ottawa? Yeah, I, I don't know what they're, I can't think of theirs. I just, again, like I Google everything. Access can, I know, but um, Ottawa yep. County, if you just want Ottawa County GIS, you'd, you'd be there. So, all right, good. Yep. Um, so then you can cut and paste legal descriptions, things like that into your listing agreements. It's a lot easier that way. It's accurate. You know, you're pulling the information right off of the website. So um, the other thing before we list a property that I would always recommend we do is a listing package through the title company. Um, and that will show you who the owner of record is, make sure that you're dealing with the actual seller. Um, if you've got a trust or a corporation, you may need to get some authority, uh, you know, the signature authority, uh, authority docs to prove that you're uh, dealing with the right person, but because um, GRAR will ask you for those. Um, and then on top of that, you want to see if there's any liens, you know, 10, 12 years ago um, when equity was really thin and we were doing a lot of short sales, you'd somebody would say, oh yeah, I owe like 95,000 on the house. And you'd be like, well, it's close, but you know, it's worth 110. I think we can sell it. And then they go, oh, by the way, well, We've got this home equity line we took out three years ago and we own 30,000 on that. So um, all of a sudden you're upside down, you're in a short sale situation. So it's always a good idea to see, you know, what liens are recorded on the house and verify that with the seller as well. Um, and just make sure that, you know, it's a good, good way to make sure you, you're selling what you think you're selling. So match up legal descriptions, permanent parcel numbers and, and whatnot. So when we get into title, training stuff we can we'll show you how to do that but if you have a need reach out to the title company yolanda and just shoot her a message and say hey i need uh i need a listing packet at the or a listing um packet on this uh property so all right um so again remember from our previous trainings i like to reorder stuff on here and the day in the way i present it so i always go to this Disclosure regarding real estate agency relationships. This, for those of you that took buyer docs class, should look familiar. And so we know that um, this is simply a disclosure statement that defines how an agent can work on a client's behalf, either as a seller's agent, a buyer's agent, um, a disclosed dual agent, or neither as a transaction coordinator, which we really try to discourage here. Um, 
because we want some form of representation for our clients from a liability reduction standpoint. And then we have this um, conceptual term called designated agency that we need to explain to our clients. And, and so the best way I tell people to explain that is, look, um, in perfect example, my new listing at um, 677 Woodbrook that went up last week, um, Jeff Marion wrote the offer on it from our office. So he was representing the buyer as a buyer's agent. We were representing the seller as a seller's agent or listing agent. And um, the representation did not constitute dual agency. So um, only dual agency occurs if the individual agent has both the buyer and the seller under contract. So um, just keep that in mind when you're explaining dual agent or designated agency. Um, Transaction coordinators, again, uh, if we're not acting as the agent of either the buyer or the seller, but providing services, then um, that carries some risk, especially if we're getting into negotiations or presenting options for buyers and sellers to consider um, if things go sideways. So you're gonna mark here as a seller's agent. Again, we are not a limited service agreement, so a uh, company. So we're gonna mark seller's agent or sub agent. Um, I would sign this. Candace has her signature in here as my teammate. Um, we're gonna check here that we are acting as a designated agent. And we're gonna mark here, typically, again, you're gonna to wanna to ask, are you working with another agent? God forbid they have already gone and listed the house with somebody else, but um, they should be signing this and including that they have not. So um, does anybody remember where I said there would, might be an example where somebody would mark does and it's still okay to put them under contract of some sort? A lot of silence, so I'm guessing not. Um, that's a no. Yeah. That's a no for me. So, I mean, if we consider the uh, if we consider the scenario where somebody's moving from the Detroit area, um, they've listed their house, and or vice versa, you're going to list it, but they're under buyer agency contract in another part of the state where you're not acti actually representing them. Um, technically, they should be marking does have an agency relationship with another real estate licensee. Um, mm -hmm. And then they should indicate whether they're acting as a buyer or a seller agent there. And hopefully you're doing the opposite. So now could be could be a scenario where they're buying a house in Detroit, they're buying one here, maybe they're an investor and they've got, you know, four buyer agencies in four different parts of the state. I don't know, but the possibility does exist. And so if they indicate that, make sure that we're filling that out correctly. Um, here you would have them mark as a seller. And again, the one, this is a single guy. So make sure that we're assigning this to no one up here. So they're not signing it twice. Little simple tricks there. So we would save that and make that part of what we're sending them. Second part is gonna be the listing agreement itself. Obviously in parentheses says required. This one's actually filled out already. We were gonna list this this week, I think. And then, um, there's some extenuating circumstances there. The seller's holding off um, listing it, but um, uh, about a week or two out, I think on this one now. So uh, your dates, typically we're gonna take a listing for six months. And so um, off the top here, again, start reading contracts to people verbatim and you're gonna put them to sleep. Um, I try to learn to paraphrase some things for people that say, you know, the, the, the beginning of this contract identifies us as the broker. You're granting us the exclusive right to sell this property um, on the beginning date. And so if that's uh, the 19th, great. If, if it's a month from now, great. Um, we'll get into the timing and the date and, and the delay of submission and all that in a minute. Um, but for right now, let's just say, hey, we're going to list it Friday. Um, here's the date. I'm going to list it for six months. Again, right now, that's an interesting conversation to have with people about what's six months from now look like when houses are selling in 45 minutes or less in some areas. So, <laughs> but keep in mind that you want this long enough to protect you in case in the event that it doesn't sell. And so standard is six. You know, we can be flexible on that from the standpoint of, hey, um, give us three months and 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 uh, we'll, we'll work on... Uh, getting an extension if it hasn't sold after three months. But right now I'm okay taking short-term listings because most of them are selling. 
And then we've got to fill in the blanks here as far as um, city of Grand Rapids in Kent County. Uh, we've got street address here, uh, the legal description. Now, older condominiums, they're going to have um, a lot of a lot of language in here. Uh, things have changed in recent years in the condo laws. I can't I can't remember exactly what year it was, but they went from recording the entire legal description for every condo unit in LIBOR to what they call an instrument number. And so this one was developed recently enough where they use this instrument number. So it's um, it's more of a, hey, we're going to record all of this under this instrument number, and then you're going to have an individual unit that goes with it, whereas before each condo had their own long, lengthy legal description. So remember, if you've got a legal description that does not fit in these two lines, um, you can simply put in there lengthy legal C attached. And you may have still, I don't know if they're still teaching in pre-license class LL and LO. Does anybody remember that from, from pre-license class, what LL and LO means? Okay, maybe they don't even teach it anymore. Probably the best they don't. Used to mean lengthy legal in listing office, meaning the, the full legal description wouldn't fit in there and you're supposed to keep it on file in the listing office. Well, now our MLS requires that you attach it and so if you have like a four paragraph or even a one paragraph list uh, legal description, just copy and paste it to a Word doc, print it to a PDF and upload it with your listing and then you've got it registered there. So um, approximate lot size or acreage, uh, this is a condo. So we have the number zero there um, and permanent parcel number right there. This obviously is specific to a condo sale. So it says unit 11 and the Avenue 23 condominium. And here again, this is that where you can put in the, the library page or document number. So really all you have to do here is take, I don't know if they're gonna let me do this, edit text. And yeah, they can. So we're gonna take that, copy that out and Paste that right in there. Obviously, if you don't have a condo, don't have to worry about that section. All right, agency representation. Um, first form we signed, disclosure regarding real estate agency relationships. Well, we know that we're supposed to get that signed anytime we talk to anybody about real estate. So seller acknowledges reading and signing the disclosure regarding real estate agency relationships. Seller understands that any licensee who shows a property may not be acting as a seller's agent. Therefore, seller understands that seller should not disclose any confidential information. So what I tell people is this, look, we're your representative. If you're leaving the house, somebody pulls up because the sign's in the yard and says, hey, I'd like to see the house, just direct them to call the number on the sign. Same thing with agents, you know, inquiries and other agents aren't representing your best interests. That's our job. Make sure that the inquiries come to us and you don't have to answer questions from other agents, just refer them back to us. So, um, and then designated agency is again, we either are or not. In our case, we are. So you'd always mark broker is a designated agency. Seller appoints, you'd put your own name in here. Um, if you're on a team, you'd put your lead agent and yourself in there as a seller's designated agent. So now we're identifying the agent within our company. And for the purpose of the agreement, seller shall have an agency relationship with the brokerage. So, um, and this is one thing I've never really gotten well defined is as the broker here, if um, I did get into dual agency, like with my last deal with Jeff, because I'm also his broker. But um, I just tell people for the purpose of agency relationships, I'm representing them and he's representing the other client. So uh, you'll want my name in here for as long as I'm walking around here as the supervisory broker. So make sure you fill that in correctly. Um, it goes on to talk about the possibility of dual agency. So again, our role as dual agents, again, it has to be our buyer and our seller both under contract. And it has to be agreed to in writing, which is a separate form once you get to that, that buyer position or that purchase agreements um, uh, stage of the game. But we want the acknowledgement that the broker is not going to willingly or knowingly do anything that might place either party at a disadvantage 
we kind of assume a role as an intermediary and we're not going to disclose to the buyer that the seller might accept a price other than the listing price or vice versa that the seller to the buyer might be willing to pay a higher price. So, all right. Um, who can give me any information about the Land Division Act? Show of hands. All right. Um, not a big deal. Know this. Um, if you're if you are selling um, acreage that can be split, um, could be as small as like five acres in, in Ada Township or something, maybe 80 acres in, in um, Nuevo County. Anytime you're selling acreage, the seller has the right to reserve how many splits can be taken and when they can happen. So the Land Division Act is a state law that says if the property is not platted and seller intends to divide the property for the purpose of the sale, seller is advised that seller must comply with the terms and condition of Man Michigan Land Division Act. Broker makes no representations regarding any seller's rights or obligations under the act. Seller is advised to contact an attorney regarding seller's rights and obligations. So what that, I mean, what that really says in a nutshell is, look, you can control the amount of splits on here. We advise you to talk to an attorney about it. Um, I tell people this, it's, it's in place for, let's say, um, you know, they, they, somebody wants to sell the family homestead on, on 30 acres and they don't want a subdivision behind them, but they want to keep that house and stay living there for the next 20 years during their, their retirement years. This allows them to say, hey, I'm going to sell you this land back here, but I don't want to see any splits here for 10 years. Um, I only want to see three acre minimum splits. I want to, I don't want to see it um, turned into a subdivision. Um, and so they have some control over that. Um, but again, we're going to refer them to um, a real estate attorney to figure out exactly, and the township or municipality to figure out exactly what they can and can't control on that. Uh, fixtures and improvements. Again, we, I, I tell people, and, and you've heard this from me in the buyer doc session um, regarding the purchase agreement too, that um, anything here that's attached should stay with the house. Um, there's some specific things that we want to make mention of here. Um, security systems, so like ADT, are those owned or rented systems or not applicable? Not applicable mean they, they're not in the house. Um, water softener, owned or rented. I deal with a lot of, of uh, water softener issues. Um, People rent their water softener, probably goes on auto debit for like eight bucks a month and they forget that they don't own it. And then property changes hands and Culligan calls and says, how come you're not making payments anymore? And then we have to negotiate a buyout on it because the seller didn't disclose that the water softener was rented. So sellers can, or buyers can assume those leases too. So uh, again, if you don't have a water softener, mark NA. Okay, so back to that example, like the, the buyout, you dealt with like a Culligan's, you know, water softener. What what would be a buyout for that? Like typically? It depends, it depends on the age of the equipment, the model, you know, there's all there's all kinds of variables on that. So, you know, I, I did one a couple of years ago where it was like $800 or something like that. So, and if it didn't happen, then they could press the issue that. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's that their equipment, they own it and they're going to they're going to probably take somebody to court to get it back or get compensation for it. So, no, I'm saying from like the, 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 uh, the buyer standpoint, like, could they pull, like, you know, pull, I like, say like, I wouldn't have bought this house if this water, you know, if I knew I had to do this water softener or something, you know? Oh yeah. Any argument can come up off of that. So we, you know, it's best to always ask if you're going to list property and you see a water softener in the basement, say, Hey, is that owned or rented? And if you see like a Culligan sticker on there, um, make sure. <laughs> Cause they, they sell them you too. I mean, Culligan right. does other, there's other companies out there that do this. And so you just want to make sure that you have, um, have the right information. So, um, because again, after the fact, it's always going to get ugly on who owes what for what on that. So um, cooking fuel tanks is a little interesting um, in that a lot of times those are rented. A lot of people don't even know. Like if I'm moving into a property out in, you know, north of Cedar Springs and I need propane for my heating fuel and I call um abc propane company 
they come out, they drop off a tank and fill it. And, you know, I don't know whether I own that thing or not. So <laughs> you may have to call the heating and cooling or the heating uh, fuel company in order to figure that out. So a lot of people don't even know, like they think just because, um, and we use this term pig because they're round and they look like pigs sitting in the yard. So um, <laughs> you'll hear that term. If uh, you see a pig in the yard, ask, ask if they own it or not. Um, because some of those, you know, they work on these contracts like, hey, if we, if you, if you use our tank and we won't charge you rent for it, but you're, you know, we'll sign you up on a budget program, and come fill it twice a year or whatever. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know. Everybody's got their own hook on those things and just make sure that you're conveying that information to the, to the buyer uh, effectively and they know what they're getting into. So um, also includes, this would include uh, here, we've got range oven and refrigerator written in there. Um, in the instance of dishwasher, there isn't one in this unit. Um, appliances would always go in there, washer and dryer, make sure you're putting that in there if they're going to leave it. Does not include, that's what we call our reserve items. And so uh, maybe the playground equipment, uh, maybe, you know, plant plantings can be reserved. Um, I've had people say, oh, that's my great grandma's, you know, rose bush out there. I want to take that with us. It's January. You got to, you can't dig it up till um spring or whatever so they want to come back in the, in the spring and take it so we we'd want to make mention of something like that um i got a little japanese maple that my dad grew from a seedling that i planted at a lake property i owned and i actually it's in my landscape bed at my house now so <laughs> i actually I'm know a lot of people who do that i mean they you know carried around a plant with them the, everywhere they go yeah oh yeah yep it happens so um Another thing on heating and cooking fuels. So this pertains to um, your propane tanks again. Seller is obligated to keep fuel in there, especially this time of year is where it's so crucially important because, and again, this is just a, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna tell you you have to do this. Um, so the pipes don't freeze, that's why it's there. Um, sale price, this one, I think we're going to be probably around 148,000 on this. So just put your sale price in there. And then, um, terms on this, we're offering cash and new mortgage. This is an, this is what's called the non-warrantable, uh, condo association, meaning you can't get a conventional loan really on this. It has to be a portfolio loan. So even though we put conventional in here, it's, it's kind of a hybrid um, loan that the bank keeps in house. They won't sell to Fannie or Freddie. If you're doing um, seller financing in the form of a land contract, make sure you put what the seller's willing to um, accept for those terms as far as down payment amount, interest amount. Um, I think we'll probably end up having to do a whole session on land contracts at some point. So everybody has a good understanding of how those work, but if somebody wants, and we don't see a lot of this, you know, interest is so cheap right now. Um, market's so competitive, but you know, things change, you know, five years from now, you maybe see more land contracts. Um, equity out, that's one of those things like a formal land contract assignment. Um, I cannot honestly tell you if I've ever checked this box in 22 years of real estate where we, I don't even know if you can offer a formal, the only assume the loans anymore are VA. So I suppose you could check this if the seller has a VA loan and he is okay assuming it. But in this market, like just have people go get a new loan. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's just simpler. Um, your brokerage fee. So um, again, for those of you that have been kind of through day one um, training, uh, you may or may not hear us talk about commissions, um, depending on which session you're in, but we are a full service brokerage. We strive for 6% on all of our listings. Um, and really we put that thousand dollars in there for a maximum or for a minimum, if the listing, very rarely would you find a listing uh, where you wouldn't earn 3% on a side and get a thousand bucks, but um, maybe a lot or a small postage stamp piece of land or something you could, you could do that with. Um, so you put in here 6%, if you can get seven, great. Um, those are kind of, um, falling by the wayside. If somebody's beating you up on commission or they want a discount, um, that has to be approved by Judy. Uh, if you can't get a hold of her, you, her, you can always call me. Um, and 
you know, we're a big company. And so we don't want to advertise that we discount any commissions. Um, we can make exceptions. There always are. Uh, but the other part of that is, you know, we're sharing that commission with another brokerage, which is down here in the participation section. And, you know, if, if our standard is to give 3% to a buyer's agent, then do you want to take less than your half, especially if we're covering marketing fees and, you know, paying for pictures and photographs and video and all that other stuff. So um, we always tell people, sell your value. As a new agent, it is, it's easy to say, yes, I'll do that. Um, I've done it. I've always, you know, I'm flexible, right? I don't want to hold up a deal. I want business. Um, we, we do it for the right reasons, but I don't advertise that I'm a discount broker. And, you know, as the, as the industry evolves and changes, uh, we may see some pressure on that 6%. When I first got in, it was 7%, about 50% of the time, and you'd get paid three and a half as a buyer's agent. And that's evolved pretty much to standard six across the board and 3% being offered. So um, sell your value and make sure that if you do need to make a concession on commission that you're getting approval for it also. Now, what do we get say paid 6% on? Well, sale price, obviously, right? Um, or total lease amount. Um, and in commercial, we do it based on, you know, if you sign a five-year lease and lease payments are 20 grand a year, you're getting paid, you know, $3,000 typically on a $100,000 lease on gross rents. Now you can also say, what if it's traded or, or leased or um, by the broker, or by the seller during that period? We have a protection period in there for us. We put in three months, you're free to put in six, 12, whatever you want on that, um, whatever you feel comfortable with, with your clients. Now, be aware that this only protects you if the property expires and doesn't get relisted. So let's say we list this this week and six months goes by, nobody's bought it. Um, I know it's kind of hard to believe in this market right now, but, um, and we go to the seller and say, hey, would you like to extend the listing? And they're like, no, um, I think we're gonna go with another company. And, they, and then the week after it expires, it gets relisted with Remax or Green Ridge or even somebody else from this office. Um, that this protection period only pertains to those properties that are not relisted. Once that property gets relisted by um, another brokerage, then you really don't have any protection. That's their listing now and whoever goes and buys it, um, buys it. But this would pertain to if we, sh if we had shown that property to a buyer or a tenant during that period, during the listing period, and they come around after the inspection or expiration period and turn around and buy that property. And so when the market's a lot more static and properties aren't selling and you see more expireds out there, there has been a lot of instances where, you know, buyer goes back after it expires and purchases it. So it's a very rare occasion these days, but um, again, market conditions will change. So you have to have an understanding of what that protection period does and how it works. So any questions on that? All right. So participation in the MLS, um, pay close attention to this. I'm going to give you an explanation on this and you're going to see on the MLS these same fields of sub-agent, buyer's agent, transaction coordinator. So we put in their standard 030. If you're going to offer less than 3%, um, it may be a bank owned listing where they where they mandate 2.5%. We'll make that exception, but any exception off of 3% has to be approved by uh, Judy or myself. So that's our company policy on this section right here of buyer agent. Now, the reason we put zero in here is it's kind of an incentive. So we know that if somebody from um, Remax doesn't have a buyer agency contract and they write an offer on our listing, they're automatically, they're not a buyer's agent. Um, they are a sub-agent of the seller. That's how agency law works in Michigan. And so if they're acting as a sub-agent of the seller, um, we're not going to pay them anything because I want to give people the incentive to be the buyer's agent. 
And so by not offering anything, I'm not obligated to pay them if they don't have a buyer agency contract. And so it get, should give them the incentive to be a buyer's agent, it takes a liability off of us and off of them of representing or possibly misrepresenting our client. Does that make sense? Okay. So zero here, buyer's agent here, um, transaction coordinator, again, 0% of the sale price. The re it, very similar reason why we do that. Um, so the, the conventional mistake on, that you'll see on the MLS is let's say it's a 7% listing and they're offering three. Sometimes you'll see the number four in here. Well, that agent that filled that out has made a mistake and they think that that's their portion of the commission. And it's, it's not. The reason we put zero in there is because that's what we are. We are offering zero dollars for somebody that is not representing their buyer as a buyer's agent. So, so does that, what, um, another brokerage list that number as well? Can they put like 2%, you know what I mean? If they wanted yeah, to. If they're, it, yeah. If, if they're putting 2% in there, I'm guessing it's probably because they took a 5% listing and they're only putting two in there because they're doing five minus the three they're offering is two. That's not the case. It's, it's what you're offering a, an agent from another company not representing their buyer. Right. And transaction coordinator would be the same way. So just remember 030 here and when and on the MLS. So um, again, inquiries, we're gonna request that the, um, any, any inquiries for the property, seller will refer to the broker. Um, so again, somebody pulls up, hey, I see the sign. I've had people do that, like pull up, see the sign, guys in the yard mowing the lawn and, and he lets them in the house. I'm like, my own brother-in-law did that once. I was like, come on, <laughs> you know, just refer to the sign, have them call us, we'll make the appointment, we'll take them through. Because again, we don't know if they're ill intent. We don't know if they're, you know, case in the joint, um, if they're even qualified as a buyer. So just make sure that all inquiries come to us now. In the event that um, somebody says, hey, I've already may have a buyer for this. My, my cousin's brother-in-law wants to buy the house. He hasn't made up his mind or he's trying to get financing. The seller can reserve a buyer, uh, but it's only for three days. Um, so they got to get off the stick and, and, and do something. And so we can, re seller can reserve a buyer. We'd put it in the other sections. Uh, for up to three days, that's MLS regulations, and um, they really want to limit that. And I believe it's only one buyer. I think I've been able to get more than one buyer reserved, but um, typically we just tell them, hey, you can reserve one buyer, um, in which case you wouldn't know a commission. But in the event that this goes up in three days, you know, they got to they got to come forward. So. so three days to to receive a uh, purchase agreement signed accepted purchase agreement by an identified yes by an identified um yeah. individual in the in the listing contract so okay good all right uh title um again we see all this title language in here in the event of a sale seller will convey or agree in writing to convey by warranty deed marketable title to the property subject to conditions limitations reservation of oil, gas, and other mineral rights, existing zoning ordinances and buildings and use restrictions. So again, you're gonna get that title report um, that ensures the policy or the policy that ensures the deed. Um, make sure we're, we're ordering that rather quickly um, and that we're going through it with our clients. Um, it's where you run into problems is if there's liens on the property that did not get released properly home equity line from three sales ago shows up, you know, you got to get those things cleared up. So, but by signing this, they, they are essentially saying they have, you know, the ability to convey the deed and they'll, they'll agree with the ordering and title policy. So uh, possession and occupancy, this would uh, be either a choice that you're going to offer on the MLS um, until close or 30 days after the close, 60, you know, 60 days, you're gonna make it into some lender issues, but um, in this day and age, you know, 30 days free of charge is kind of the standard. So um, make sure that you're discussing when your sellers can be out based on their timeline. So 
All right, marketing. So this um, authorizes us as the broker and the listing agent to market the property through any media and record and or display. So this, I mean, this basically just says, say to the seller, hey, this authorizes us to take pictures, use them as we see fit, um, put for sale signs on the property. Um, some people are averse to that. You may, if it's a condo, you may have to check and see if you can even put a sign in the yard or the window or whatever. Some some places prohibit that. So um, broker thought, and then it, there's also language in here about your key boxes. And so broker the, authorized to have access to the property in all parts for the purpose of showing at reasonable hours. Um, broker is or is not authorized to put a key box on the property. You've got electronic um, key is antiquated. They don't even have those anymore. And then um, combination. So make sure you discuss with them pros and cons of a electronic key box versus a combination box and how our showing time app works and when they're willing to show the property. Again, right now, the standard MO is, hey, we're going to get this thing listed on a Thursday. You guys are going to leave for the weekend. We're going to have 100 showings and 10 offers by Monday afternoon. And, and so you're going to want to go through that, that process with them a little bit. So um, authorization to order services. So in the event that um, seller says, hey, can you order the well and septic inspection for me? Again, it's your service proposition. It's part of what we do in this business. Um, this lets them know that, hey, even though you may be authorizing me to order things, uh, does not mean that, um, that we're responsible for paying for them and that that would be on the seller. Some of those service providers are going to demand payment at service. Others will take payment at close. Make sure you're turning in your invoices to the title company to make sure those things get paid because if you order a survey, don't turn in the invoice and um, they're going to come after you and then you may have to pay it. So submission of offers. Um, so this clause is can kind of trip you up when you're when you're discussing it with a seller. And so I tell people this, look, we've got a choice to either present offers to you after, um, after you've already accepted an offer or not. And so the way this actually reads is it said the seller agrees that all offers and counter offers shall or shall not continue to be submitted until closing. Seller further agrees that this shall not obligate the broker to continue to market the property after an offer has been accepted by the seller. So right now we see a lot of backup offers coming in. Um, hey, here's a backup on 123 Main Street. Make sure that that deal falls apart. So you still have to present those offers. I always mark shell. I don't know why anybody would mark shell not, um, but it's an option. Um, one of these days, I'm going to have to dig into the history of real estate and find out why they would not continue to be submitted. Maybe they're just too busy. They don't want to be bothered with it. But um, yeah, that's just good communication. Hey, we got another offer. Do you want to consider a backup or do you want me to hold this until we know where we're at with inspections? So just, you know, that kind of conversation. Um, Non-discrimination, pretty self-explanatory in the terms of the seller. Um, keep this in mind. The seller ever says anything that would sound like they want to discriminate on who buys their property. Um, it is illegal for us to take the listing. Um, walk out and call me. <laughs> so uh, it doesn't happen a lot, um, but it could even be in passing. Um, you know, I started this business 22 years ago. It was certainly after all of all of the civil rights um, laws that we have today were enacted. And so I'm not privy to an experience where anybody's really ever said that to me. But depending on conversations, some people, you could pick up on that a little bit. Um, maybe it's subtle. Um, maybe it's blatant. If it's blatant, walk out the door and tell them you cannot list the property if they're going to discriminate against who buys the house. Um, some people are very entrenched in a neighborhood and want to, you know, feel this need to protect their neighbors from who buys the house. I know I love my next door neighbor. Um, she's like family to me. And I, I know if I ever sell my place, I want her to have a good neighbor. I'm not going to discriminate, but I want good people to live next to her. But other people don't always think that way. And so, um, again, in that non-discrimination, now we have language in there about um, 
letters from buyers and what we call those love letters. And so it says in bold print there now, they just changed the language on this. Before it was an option, now it's just a, it's a NAR mandate. It's a local Michigan Realtors mandate. Seller directs the broker that letters from the buyer will not be presented with any offer to purchase. So um, can anybody give me an example of why you wouldn't want to present a letter from a buyer to your seller? Any thoughts on that? They'll be persuaded to like go with a lower, uh, a, a lower offer or, you know, they'll go with uh, their grandmother instead of like a, a, I get the concept of it, but you yeah, know I what mean, I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, obviously it's about the bottom line. Our job is to get them the best, the best price and that, you know, the best price might not even be, or the best deal may not even be the best price. Uh, maybe it's cash versus risky financing or something. What we want to avoid specifically is, is potential for discrimination. So let's say, um, Crystal, you have buyers that are uh, of, of um, certain race. Let's say they're Hispanic. You present your offer with a letter that shows a picture of little, little Johnny and Susie and you know, the family picture, oh, my kids love it. Well, right there, family okay. status, right? Um, I present that offer to my sellers and they choose your offer when John had submitted an offer that was $10,000 higher, but he was, you know, we didn't indicate who his buyers were and, or vice versa. Maybe it was, maybe it's blatant discrimination. Maybe you're sending over pictures of people of color and they're picking an offer for, $20,000 less The people are white. They know they're white, you know? And so it, it's just, it's muddy. And we don't like it. And let the, let the facts on the contract speak for themselves to the seller's bottom line is the simplest way to avoid any, anything happening there. So, um, and, you know, I, I was actually at the board yesterday with, with Julie Reitberg and we, we actually had a little bit of a fair housing situation that I was discussing with her and, you know, we're, I think in, in West Michigan in general, we, we kind of have this notion that, you know, discrimination doesn't happen. Um, there's nothing blatant here that we see, uh, you know, again, I've been, I've been around the block a few times in this business and I haven't seen it specific, you know, and, and blatant, but I think there's still some, you know, some subtle things that go on. And, and that was certainly the case in, in this instance that we were chatting about. And it, you know, we just, we can't, we can't think like that. And, and we just need to, we need to overcome that. I mean, you're going to come across things in this, in this, you know, all walks of life. Um, I have people that we moved um, out to the country. They were living in Wyoming and, and um, there was a nonprofit that owned the house next to them. And they were concerned because they were bringing in refugees and, and, you know, I can't stop people's fears and thought processes. Um, all I can do is, is my job. And so, you know, but um, you're going to see it from time to time. And it, and it, it, like I said, it's not blatant, but it could be subtle and, and certainly exists. So be aware of it, understand fair housing laws. We take them seriously. Uh, we train on it. We continue to educate on it, continues to evolve. I think, you know, anything that happened in the past two years in our nation um, has brought to light maybe some more of the subtleties of things that happen in this world too. And, and, you know, as I, as I say, I'm, you know, I, I'm a white male. I can't speak for anybody and walking not in their shoes. And so um, if you feel that you're seeing this or, or, and discrimination can happen in a lot of ways. Um, I'm not going to get, you know, spend the rest of the day on unfair housing regulations, but um, it can happen in a lot of different ways and a lot of subtle ways. And if you see it, make sure you talk to us about it Make sure, and, and just ask, you know, it never hurts to ask, hey, is this a problem? Um, what's interesting is, you know, how far we've come. I remember listing a house on the southeast side of Grand Rapids in this neighborhood where you read the title work from the 1960s and it said, shall not be sold to a person of color. And it's like in writing in the title work. And it's like, obviously can't be enforced today with today's laws, but back, you know, even as little as 50 years ago, 60 years ago, it was in, in the writing that they could. That's crazy. Tell people of color. And, and yeah, I mean, when you read stuff like that, that's like kind of jarring you awake going, oh my gosh, this was real, you know? <laughs> and so, 
um, kind of kind of interesting from that standpoint. And you guys, um, I think uh, one of you was in the office last week when I had the whole uh, FHA paperwork out from my parents' house and that abstract of time. I just, I love old documents like that, looking through stuff and, and it can be an eye-opening and, and uh, educational experience. So um, modifications, uh, contract can be modified in writing, amended. So let's say we need to drop the price as long as it's in writing and the broker and, and uh, seller agree to it. Seller's disclosure statement. Now we know that there is some exemption, but any seller that owns this one to four unit property in the state of Michigan is responsible for filling out the seller's disclosure form. We'll go through that in a minute. Uh, representation of the age of structure. So this was built prior to 1978, marked there. So all the responsibilities of the seller of residential lead-based paint uh, apply from paragraph 22. And basically it says seller has to furnish any documents they have on lead paint. Um, they have to give the buyer an opportunity to inspect for lead paint and um, disclose any known lead paint that they, that they know of in the house. Now, further we get away from 1978, homes are painted, doors and windows are replaced. Um, we don't take this lightly because it is a federal regulation, but most people um, typically do not have records of lead paint, nor do they have any knowledge of lead paint in the home. So, um, but you must give them a 10 day period to inspect for lead paint unless they choose to waive it, which most people do, especially in this market. So be aware that um, it is your obligation to have that form filled out though. Uh, disclosure of information. This just says that we are gonna report the sale to the MLS. Um, so much like the comparables we pull for market analysis, sales show record. That is a full regulation. Um, you're not going to get around it. I tried this week. doesn't happen. So <laughs> anyone wants to hear that story, come look me up. I'll get, I got another story to tell you for an hour. So <laughs> um, this checkbox is simply shows that the, eight, the owner's name would appear as agent for owner. And that concept has come around and, and really it's kind of antiquated in my eyes. Before you could go on um, the BSA software or access can pull up any own, in, owner information you ever wanted in three clicks of a mouse. Um, you used to have to go to register these to find out who the owner was. And so now, um, back then you could put in their agent for owner. So John Doe doesn't show up as the seller in case he wanted to remain anonymous on there until the, you know, the closing happened. Now I think it's, you know, again, the information's out there. It doesn't really matter, but I typically check that. It just tells them that, you know, hey, we're looking out for you. So your name isn't broadcast across the listing information. Uh, indemnification. This um, holds us harmless for any suit, liability, damage, or expense arising out of any showing of the property and based in whole or in part on the condition of the property. And I lightly tell people, look, if somebody falls down the stairs at a showing that I'm at, I'm not responsible. If they can prove that I pushed them, um, probably am. <laughs> that would be that intentional or negligence act um, uh, uh, thing on there that follows that statement. So um, understand that, yeah, if we're out blatantly abusing a property, we could be responsible for it, but make sure the home still has insurance. Um, because we're not responsible and, and things will happen during your listings. You know, I've gotten calls, um, this broke, somebody dropped that. I was at a showing, another agent was there. He fell down the stairs right behind me and like took out the Christmas tree that was in a glass, in a glass vase and stuff. And I was like, well, not my fault, but, uh, somebody broke something. So, um, it, things happen, you know, um, it's how you handle them. Uh, again, We've had door hinges ripped off, um, locks broken, whatever. You know, you just go and get it fixed. But uh, consent to fees, uh, we know from RESPA, Real Estate Settlement Compliance Act or Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, that uh, we need to disclose any financial benefit we get outside from earning the commission. That would be a placement fee. Uh, I just tell people, look, our home warranty company sends our company um, a placement fee when we sell one of these and we need to disclose that to you. So 
broker's remedies. Now, we've listed this property for six months. Um, actually had this happen a couple of times. Go through the photos, get the first ad set, start your Facebook ads, house on the market for a day and the seller calls and says, we can't move, we're not moving. <laughs> um, actually went through staging at a home, doing some light remodeling, took the pictures, sent the pictures to them. They liked their house so much they decided to stay there. So <laughs> what do you do, right? Um, we're in the customer service business, not the hold hostage to a contract business, but we've got some expenses. This allows us to collect um, in the event that they want to cancel the listing early for any expenses that we've cur incurred up to that point. Uh, again, it, we've never really collected on this. There's There's been times where I did have a commercial client that we had a few hundred dollars and, and a lot of time involved in. And he told us he had a buyer. We were going to reserve the buyer for him. He's like, no, no, I still want your help selling this property. Buyer walks in and says, you, got, you don't need those, those guys. Tried to cut us out of the deal. He turned tail on us, didn't want to pay us. I said, look, just pay me for my expenses. And he got really indignant with me. Like, he's like, I don't owe you anything. And you're just, a, you know, short of calling me a crook. Told me I was holding them over a barrel. I, and I documented everything. I'm like, look, I've been to your property five times. We inventoried everything in your restaurant. Um, I got pictures. Here's my receipts. We did this. We did this. It was like, I wanted a thousand bucks out of the guy. You know, it wasn't that much. And, and uh, he didn't want to pay me. And so I wasn't the broker at that point. I turned it over to the broker and, you know, they had the attorney write the letter and we would have settled for a nominal amount. And then when it threatened to go to court, I was like, look, I'm going to charge you a full commission on this because you sold the property out from under me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and we ended up settling, but it, rare occasions, stuff like that happens, but um, just know that you do have protection in there. Again, when you present these documents, you want to make sure that you're not putting the fear of God in people too. So it's not like I'm going to sit there and tell this story to my listing clients. I want you to understand what, what remedies you have, but you know, it just, simply the presentation of, hey, we have the opportunity to collect in the event that we cancel the listing early for any marketing expenses or, or uh, other expenses that we incur. So um, citizenship. Seller is a United States citizen or resident alien. So this um, needs to be checked, yes or no, for what is called FERPTA, which is the um, Foreign Investment Something or Other Tax Act. Um, basically, non-US citizens are taxed on sales of property and that can actually affect the buyer and a withholding of a certain percentage of the purchase price of the home from the buyer in the event that the seller is overseas and non-collectible. So very rare circumstances. If you get a non-US um, citizen, talk with your title company, have them talk with their CPA because not there's a lot of exceptions to this rule, but mark that for sure, if they, if you, if they aren't a citizen, make sure you're marking no. So um, faxes, electronic distributions, um, obviously electronic signatures are good. Um, wire fraud, again, we, we preach wire fraud. We advise them that wire fraud is an increasing problem and to make sure that um, they're doing everything in their power to make sure that they are being safe if they are directing money through wire transfers. Audio surveillance. Um, this actually came up in discussion this week um, with ring doorbells. Um, seller understands that use of an audio device during showings, open houses or inspections may result in a violation of state and or federal wiretapping statutes. Um, broker recommends that the seller disable any recording devices. However, like a ring doorbell is not a recording device unless you set it up that way. But yet you can still see who's at your house when you're not there. Um, this instance came up because people went to the house. Uh, they knew the sellers were home. They could see them. They ring the doorbell and they still wouldn't come to the door. <laughs> um, and it kind of goes back to some of the discussion we had about fair housing. Is there potential for discrimination through audio or visual, you know, monitoring systems? And just to be, be aware that um, 
you know, there, those systems exist and there's certain circumstances where it's not always legal to record people if they don't know they're being recorded. So, um, and advise your buyers that too. Like when you're showing a house, um, you don't know, maybe that teddy bear sitting in the corner has cameras in its eyes or something. And, you know, be careful what you're saying in a house because um, people are listening and people are watching, even though they may be potentially breaking the law with that. Um, other conditions, we put our broker fee in there, um, our, our processing fee. Uh, 395 is, I think that's company standard now. Um, <laughs> we matched what the company went to. So ours is 395 as well. Um, make sure you sign your listing contracts, either electronically or, or with ink. Um, agent for broker. Now, again, keep in mind, like when it says broker, that's Keller Williams, not me. I'm the managing broker. I'm the broker in charge, designated realtor, whatever you want to call it. But the broker is the brokerage, Keller Williams, Grand Rapids East. That's who you're the agent for. Um, I don't need to sign listing contracts. Um, so you can sign them yourself as an agent. Uh, make sure your, your sellers are signing. Now, you have joint if you mark joint ownership, you should probably have two signatures on here. If you have sole ownership, uh, one signature is fine. If they are a trustee or a trust or a, an LLC that's selling the property, make sure you have the proper documentation showing that whoever signs your document, because the board's gonna ask for it. You're gonna have to upload it um, to the MLS. You're gonna make sure that, that they have the proper authority to sign that document. So, um, and then uh, if the sellers, again, ancillary information, email addresses, phone numbers, you should have this. It's a little antiquated, but again, in the, in the event, um, went through this last year, had one of our agents actually pass away and she was elderly. Um, we couldn't get into her command database because she didn't use it but she did do a very good job of filling these out completely. And so we have our listing contracts on file. Uh, we were able to pull the seller records and I was able to contact the seller and, and say, look, we've got some more unfortunate news. Your agent has passed, but um, we were able to contact it. So again, some of this stuff is protection for me. Um, if you fall off the face of the earth, we know how to get hold of your clients. So just keep that in mind. Any questions on listing contracts? All right, that's the big one. Save my changes there. I think it real quick, me. real quick, Jason. Do you yeah. use this if it's a uh, FISBO? No, because you're not actually listing the property. We'll go through that in a little bit. Okay. Um, I don't know if we we'll get to that today or not, but um, we'll we'll buzz through the rest of these and then yep. we'll go through some of the other documents that we use. So, and I do have a quick question too, Jason. Yeah. So, um, where can I find other recordings like this? I have to go, but where can I find um, material. We're, we're just in the process. I've, I've done two other sessions. I've got it. I've got them. It's a process. I got to download them okay. from um, Zoom and then I've got to produce them into YouTube and then publish the links. And then eventually we're going to have that on another platform where you can actually go in and, and get like, I don't want to say class okay. credit, but it's, okay. it's monitored. It shows that you showed up, took the took the took the course so on other topics other than just this one correct yeah we've got a list we're working through um, okay i've got 20 different topics that we're going to eventually have stuff like this on so but Perfect. just getting started with some of this so but yeah stay stay tuned um i did publish the changes to the mls docs um on our facebook page i put that up as a youtube link you can go in and watch that one um okay some of these Today, we've already discussed when we did buyer docs, the changes hadn't occurred yet. So uh, you may want to go in and watch that one, refresh it. It's about 15 minutes long on that one. So take care. I got to go. All right. Thanks for joining us. Yes. All right. Uh, your delay of submission of listing addendum. So you go out, you want to make sure you get the listing, you sign it with today's date, but um, you're not going to actually put it on the MLS until, you know, March 1st. So you'd fill this in with the property address. Um, this client I know really well. I know they're not going to list it with anybody else. So we're just kind of waiting until the day to list it. Um, but you would put the us at Keller Williams as the listing broker in here and the seller's name in here. 
and then put the date that it's actually going to show up on the MLS. So um, then this would get submitted with your listing to the MLS. So you can have that. Now, keep in mind, you cannot, if you fill one of these out today, February 16th, and doesn't hit the MLS till March 1st, you cannot market that property until the day that it goes live. You can't put up sale signs, you can't post on social media, can't advertise coming soon. Um, it protects you from losing the listing to anybody else, but it does not allow you to market in advance. So that's in bold print right there. Now, let's say like this particular seller, I've got a pretty good relationship with. We're not going to list it. I, I fill out my listing contract for March 1st. Then with their permission, I can put up a sign and put up coming soon and actually market the property. But I've got one of these forms. I can't do any advanced marketing on it. Wiring scam, just again, another form we haven't signed regarding wire transfer fraud. I think we went through this on buyer docs. Uh, make sure, again, you're, you're um, telling your clients how to be safe with, uh, from wire fraud. Um, seller's disclosure statement. Rule number one, do not fill these out for your clients. Um, write that down, carve it in your forehead, whatever you got to do to remember it. Um, Carve it backwards so when you look in the mirror in the morning, you can actually read it. That'd be my advice. So, <laughs> um, or Sharpie, you know, at least remember it for three days, whatever, until it washes off. Um, you can fill this part out. Obviously, the address, nothing wrong with that. Send it over to them. You'd send this over in dot loop separate with full edit capabilities, but they're going to go through here and mark yes, the range works. No, it doesn't. I don't know, or it's not available. Make sure that they fill if, like, this one does not have a dishwasher. Make sure they're marking not available instead of no, because then they're indicating that they have a dishwasher that doesn't work when in fact they don't have one. So um, have them fill this out to the best of their ability. They're going to have questions when, when they're filling this out. Um, tell them the best policy always is full disclosure and that um, if they know of something even prior to their ownership, that they need to disclose it. Like if they knew the basement flooded, or had a fire 20 years ago and they've only owned it for five years, they still need to, to disclose that. And they, they have an opportunity to explain it. You know, hey, the basement leaked once, we had it waterproof, we haven't had any incidents of it since. And so you can coach them through how the best way to fill this out, but make sure that they are filling it out themselves. Best answer, if they don't know the answer is unknown because specifically, and I think we talked about this in the buyer doc class that Marking no means you have specific knowledge that there is not an issue. And if you don't know, marking unknown kind of gives you at least that little bit of liberty there. So dates go in here for their ownership. And there's other sections in here that says the buyer should obtain professional advice on inspections. Um, buyers are advised to obtain certain information regarding Sex Offender Registration Act. Um, Buyers advise that state equalized value of the property, homestead exemption, and other real estate property tax information is appropriate. So again, this, we're not relying on this document for warranty of goods. Um, it is simply a disclosure of condition by the seller, still advising our clients, buyer clients to get uh, inspections done. And along with that, we typically present the lead-based paint disclosure form that they need to fill out. Now, if the house is built after 1978, just have them fill this section out up here, address, signature, they're warranting that um, property address, it was built after 78, lead paint doesn't even apply. But in the event it was built prior to 78, then the seller would indicate whether or not they have knowledge or reports or records of lead-based paint. and they would sign it as the listing agent. You also need to initial and sign this, informing them of, the, them of their obligations. And then the buyer, which remember we covered in buyer docs, um, fills out this portion of it and signs it. And so again, even if it's just the top form, make sure that gets signed, make sure that gets turned in with your paperwork. So 
in the event that we are closing at GR title, you are going to want to fill out the RESPA uh, form referred to as RESPA form, but it pertains to our joint ownership of Grand Rapids title. And this is not their title policy charges. This is just an example of a $100,000 purchase amount and a mortgage policy amount, what those charges are. I tell people this, title rates are set by the state of Michigan. So whether you close at Chicago title, Grand Rapids title, XYZ title, those rates are probably gonna be all within a penny of each other. Um, closing rates charged um, by each title company vary a little bit. And for us to do in-house service, it's easier for me to run down the hall and talk to Yolanda or Deb about a title issue I have than it is to get somebody on the phone that I've never dealt with before. Seller is free and clear, buyer is free and clear to choose whatever title company they want. But um, in the event you choose grab its title that there is financial benefit to Keller Williams and its agents. So simple way to explain that. If you're closing it, Metro title, whatever, don't need that sign. Um, same thing with the home warranty. If you're getting one of these done, make sure you fill it out completely. Submitting it, um, you do get $100 out of that uh, spiff, if you want to call it that. This is the full warranty form. Have your people read through this, see if it's something that they want to offer. Ray Stark is really good about putting on the home warranty sessions. Um, it's good to learn about these and what they cover, how much they cost. Again, I don't sell a lot of them. Mike Smalligan sells a ton of them. It's kind of up to the service provider, you as the agent, whether or not you want to offer this or, or continue to sell it. Um, I'm going to leave that up to you as the agent. And the survey waiver, this, I don't know why this is in seller docs. It should really be just a buyer doc, but um, I think we went over that in buyer, buyer docs. If a buyer's waiving the survey, they need to have a signature on that as well. Um, your title order author, your title order forms are in here. Um, and then make sure you're getting a payoff authorization form signed if they have a loan on the house or two or three. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they fill this out, make sure that they're putting their account numbers in here. Again, from a wire transfer fraud standpoint, I think it's a good idea to have them fill this out in person or have them print it and either send it back, send it directly to Grand Rapids title. Um, make sure that we're not hanging on to this or distributing it via email with account numbers and names on it. Um, we don't want that to fall in the wrong hands. You can see a spot down here, then you need a social security number, but it does need to be filled out completely. And we do need, um, I think lately they've been requiring a, what we call a wet signature on that with pen, not an electronic signature anyway. So just print that form out, take it to your listing appointment, have them fill it out and either have them send it to the title company or deliver it to the title company yourself. Um, so that's our main listing docs. I want to, I feel like we missed one here, but um, I think it's in the other listing docs portion of this. We are rocketing towards the finish line here, so bear with me. I'm going to go into templates here so I don't screw up my own loop and go through the additional listing docs folder here. You can add any of these docs to a loop, just go in there and into that template section. Um, we're not requiring the COVID form for, um, actually there, there is one of these forms that we're still requiring. This is for the purchase agreement. Not requiring that one. Uh, any personal property aside from appliances should be put on a bill of sale. Um, I don't like selling personal property because as soon as that um, lawnmower doesn't start in the spring, guess who they're going to call? But um, try to avoid it if you can, but sometimes it gets conveyed. Um, 
there's an addendum in here for auction properties, uh, short sales. You're not going to really get into too much of that until the market changes. Um, temporary occupancy. This is a good one from the standpoint of if we're going to occupy the home after this after the sale. Um, I really like to have this form filled out as opposed to just a purchase agreement that says, hey, you can stay here 30 days free of charge. Um, if you don't get out on time, it's 300 bucks a day. We, we kind of talked about that, but try to use this when you can. Uh, there was the PFAS scare of 2017. So pre-printed addendum came up between the buyer and the seller for well testing beyond what county standards are. Um, again, advising people to seek testing as needed. Um, I did, we just sold the house over on Woodbrook. That's happens to be an air for, airport runoff PFAS zone where they're going to get the city water soon. So make sure you're paying attention to where those, where those listings are and what those issues may be. So we'll put an offer on the house. Yeah, we got it sold. So. Nice. I was, uh, I was there this weekend with Candace. Oh yeah, that's right. You were at the yeah. open house. Yeah. Yeah, we had a lot of showings, only two offers. One was cash. And so that's one we worked with. So Damn, that's crazy. Yep. Now, uh, if you have to drop the price on a house, um, fill this out. You've got the MLS number, the property address going in there. You'd mark change price from. You can expire it early. Um, you can include, like, let's say they want to add the dishwasher or add the washer and dryer in. You can um, change it or maybe they want to take it out. You can change that. So you can change anything here on your listing contract. This is something that requires a broker um, signature on. So make sure that you're sending that to me for signature if you're dropping the price on a, on a listing. So pretty self-explanatory how to fill that one in. Mutual release. I think we, we kind of went through this on the buyer docs, but again, this also requires a broker signature. Um, that's authorized designate. That would be me as the broker. Again, Keller Williams Realty, Grand Rapids East would go in there on either side, whether we're the listing or the or the buyer's representative on that. If you get to a point of mutual release, you know, make sure you're giving me a call so we can talk through that with you on the on the first go around so you understand it too. Dual agency. So in the event that we do have a buyer under buyer agency contract that we're going to write on, on our own listing, this actually needs to be templated. That's old. <laughs> Shows you how much we do dual agency. That should be templated with, with my name in there, but you can change it, obviously. Um, put your name in there, seller, buyer, um, property. And again, it just goes through that whole disclosure process of what a dual agent is and how we can act and how we can't act. Make sure that they have an understanding of that. Uh, let's see what else is in here. That lead paint booklet. I showed you that last time. Um, the show and sell. So somebody asked about for sale by owners earlier, right? Yep. If somebody's for sale by owner and you have a buyer or they say, Hey, bring me a buyer. This is the actual form you would use. We're not listing the property. This, um, explains that obviously it names us as the, as the broker, um, names the seller in here the, again just like a listing agreement the address permanent parcel number so on uh the sale price that they're willing to accept what kind of terms they're willing to accept and then your commission in here now again you can shoot for six percent on a uh, for sale by owner that's okay but a lot of them are pretty savvy and they're probably going to offer you three they're offering you two two and a half you know get the deal done um yep and um i saw is I think I told you guys this story last time around. I had a um, buyer's dad actually give me a nice little check after the closing because he knew somehow he found out we were only getting 1% on a for sale by owner. So, um, but uh, so, and then again, there's a protection period in here. But so this just says, hey, uh, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, buyer, um, uh, we're going to not list the property, but if we bring you a buyer, we're going to we're going to still be owed a commission on it. So that's simple, simple form to get that done. All right. Um, show and sell, lead paint booklet, home warranty. This is the final page. Again, if you're waiving it, 
both buyer and seller need to waive that. I think we talked about that in buyer docs. Buyer and seller signature down here if you're waiving it. Um, everything else filled out here. If they are actually getting a home warranty, Ray Stark, again, is our home warranty rep. His contact's flying around here somewhere. So if you need to get a hold of him, any questions, make sure you're reaching out to Ray on that. So uh, let's see, agent referral form. I think we kind of went through this the other day too. This is in all of our loop folders somewhere. If you have a out of town buyer or seller that you want to refer to another agent, could be a Keller Williams agent, could be Century 21, wherever, use this form. Uh, if you're referring it, put our name info on there. Brokers do need to sign this. Um, typically, we're going to get 25% put in here. So if you have somebody in Phoenix that wants to buy or sell a house, you can send, you can earn money by referring business outside of our area. So all right. Um, Grand Rapids title order form is in here, PAF authorization again. Um, you can withdraw a listing. So understand the difference between a withdrawn and an expired listing. So if you early expire listing, like if people don't want to sell anymore or God forbid they want to fire you, you can expire it to whatever date, but then it becomes an expired listing and that can, that can become eligible for solicitation from other agents. Um, withdrawal would be used for, let's say, hey, we've, we've had 10 showings on this house. Everybody said the carpet's nasty and the rooms need to be painted and it's not worth what we're asking for it. So we're gonna actually withdraw the listing for two weeks, get some stuff done and then put it back up. Um, so it's still our listing at that point, it can still be sold, but just means it's not being marketed on the MLS. So if you get to that point where the listing needs to come down, uh, make sure you talk to one of us about either Judy or myself about how to handle that. But that's the perfect example of why you would withdraw a listing and not actually um, expire it. So get some of those seasonal properties. Maybe you got a long-term listing in a cottage and you know, it gets me November and they're like, yeah, let's just take it down until spring, something like that. So, so that's kind of a rundown of the listing documents. Again, you've got, you do have similar listing documents in the vacant land folder. So if you do vacant land, it's a little bit simpler listing document. Um, there's a seller's disclosure that's a little bit different for vacant land. Um, and so make sure that you know, you're using that if need be. Um, if you have any questions about listing a property, make sure you check with us, um, make sure you're doing it right. Obviously we're here to help. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you guys have been fairly quiet throughout this whole process, but um, that's okay. That's what Zoom is, you know, we're used to it. So <laughs> there will be questions, but again, you know, practice this stuff. I Go ahead and create a, a listing of your own in dot loop and practice filling those forms out. When you get into script practice, practice going through the forms so you have an understanding of how to explain this kind of in layman's terms. So you're not just reading verbatim with the contract up to your face and putting people to sleep. Just understand how to explain those paragraphs, what they mean, and it'll make, make your job a lot easier when you actually do get in front of the listing client. So um, any questions before we go? So when we, when we do get our first listing, um, we're going to be pretty much, you guys, I mean, you guys are going to be holding our hands through the thing, right? Obviously you'll help us out, but I mean, oh, yeah. we're going to have to just kind yeah. of talk to our listing, right? We have our own relationship with them. And yeah. So for you on the, for you guys on the team, what I would recommend, obviously, if you get a listing lead, somebody, you know, either Todd or Candace or myself will be going with you. Um, for those of you not on a team, reach out to somebody, you know, reach out to an experienced agent in the office, tell me, hey, I got my first listing going, might need some help with this. Um, if you're really uncomfortable, split it with them, you know, co-list it with them, watch them in action, learn from them and, and uh, learn from it and polish your own presentation. You know, again, 50% of something is still better than 100% of nothing. And so never hurts to share business amongst us. Um, could be maybe you you are feeling confident and you just need a little coaching with it too. I, I remember my first listing appointment. I, they were friends of mine. I wasn't worried. You know, I just went out and listed the property. But um, maybe your situation is different and you need a little 
a little guidance, a little help and a little, little confidence boost too. And that's, that's not a bad thing. So, but um, yeah, when you, for my team, you get that first listing lead, by all means, call me. We'll, you know, we're, we're going to help you out with that too. So. I got, I have one more question on the buying side of things. Um, I'm working yeah. with a buyer who isn't, who isn't a U.S. citizen. Do I um, need to take any sort of like steps, I guess, in, with that? You know what I mean? I, I think from his end, he's pretty um, like, as far as everything I know, he can, he can, he's what he can buy a house, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, that's fine. Um, when he goes to sell it, there would,